Thank you so much for being here tonight. Good evening. I am Heather Maurer, NPWH's CEO. Thank you for taking the time out of your evening to attend tonight's product theater, generous, generously sponsored by Quest Diagnostics. I want to extend a special welcome to NPWH members in attendance tonight. If you're not a member, we encourage you to join us. NPWH is the Professional Association for Women's Health Nurse Practitioners and all APRNs practicing in women's and gender-related health care. Membership benefits include access to free CEs, discount counts at our conferences and event registration, subscription to our journal, which comes out six times a year, and much more. Please visit our website at www.npwh.org to join and explore our upcoming events. In this product theater, Dr. Mark Marscola will discuss the ways to protect your patient's reproductive health. This session will focus on the new CDC guidance on opt-out screening for chlamydia and gonorrhea for patients under the age of 25 and comprehensive testing with cervicitis and pelvic inflammatory disease. Our presenter tonight is Randy Muscolia. Dr. Muscolia is an associate professor of clinical nursing at The Ohio State University and the director of the DNP Clinical Expert Track. She is currently co-chair of the program director special interest group through the National Organization of Nurse Practitioner Fac Faculties. She's an active member of NPWH and served as a board of director and the education chair. She was awarded in the, the she was awarded the 2020 Ohio March of Dimes Nurse Educator of the Year. Her scholarship focuses on men's sexual health, the role of the women's health nurse practitioner and APR in education. I want to thank Quest Diagnostics and Randy for making this event possible tonight. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. Please enter your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. And now I will turn it over to Randy to lead the presentation and discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Heather. And thank you to Quest for sponsoring um, this talk tonight. Um, many of you on the call, I recognize and uh, appreciate all of your support. As you know, I am a huge um, guru of evidence-based practice and evidence-based clinical guidelines. And so that is really going to be the focus. Um, we'll keep coming back to those evidence-based guidelines when we're talking about protecting your patient's reproductive health and out, uh, opt-out screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia and some comprehensive testing and, and maybe some something to put on your radar for your chronic cervicitis and patients uh, ruling out pelvic inflammatory disease. So um, here's our disclaimers. A little bit about me, which you um, just heard about. For our agenda today, we're really gonna talk about two main things. We're gonna talk about the new CDC um, guidance on opt-out screening. As hopefully you know, those new recommendations, the new CDC guidelines came out in July of 2021. Um, and there are some new um, guidance for opt-out screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia for our patients under the age of 25, male and female. Um, the second part of um, our chat this evening is gonna be on comprehensive testing for our patients with chronic cervicitis and pelvic inflammatory disease through um, some expanded symptomatic uh, STI screening for mycoplasma genitalium and you'll hear me refer that as MGen. So 2021 CDC guidelines endorse opt-out screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, um, recommended screening for under 25 is not new um, in the CDC guidelines. What is new is endorsing this opt-out screening. So um, I'm always, um, one to one to get right into exactly what does the CDC say? And so what the CDC says exactly is that providers might consider opt-out chlamydia and gonorrhea screening, i.e. the patient is notified that testing will be performed unless the patient declines opt-out, uh, regardless of reported sexual activity for adolescents and young adult females during clinical encounters. So what we know is that um, more than 84% of females are asymptomatic for gonorrhea and chlamydia. This is not new information. Um, it's about the same for our male, uh, the male counterparts, asymptomatic about 88% of the time. 
Um, for our patients under 25, about 70% 70% of them are asymptomatic and 50% of our males are uh, asymptomatic for the under 25 age group. Um, females under the age of 25 are at a greater risk of getting gonorrhea and chlamydia because that transformation zone is wider and bigger. And that's where these viruses like to attach themselves is in that um, meaty, beefy transformation zone. And as we get older, that transformation zone gets smaller, decreasing, um, uh, surface area for the virus to attach to. Um, opt out ensures um, that patients can get more comprehensive and easier access to care. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, how we might want to implement that um, in your practices. So best practice um, is to screen all female and male patients ages 15 to 24. The CDC recommends regardless of sexual, of reported sexual activity and that patients can opt out. We'll talk about realistic reasons of why some of our patients may opt out. Um, gonorrhea and chlamydia screening is recommended um, for everyone under the age of 25. It's evidence-based from the CDC. Um, if you've read or looked at the CDC guidelines from July 2021, you'll see the amount of evidence that they have and the process they actually talk about on their website, the CDC website, the process they use to evaluate the data. And so we have all used CDC guidelines um, for treating STIs since we've been in practice. So this is nothing new. What's new is this guidance for opt-out screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, really thinking about making this a routine in your practice. So in your practice, you already have um, routine screening guidelines for pap smears, for example. So as a provider in my office, um, I would have the pap smear based on our guidelines, the most recent up-to-date evidence-based ASCCP guidelines. And so my medical assistant would know based on guidelines if they needed a pap smear or not, and that would be ready in my drawer. Um, without even having to have a, a big discussion about it. What, what um, opt-out screening would be that anyone under the age of 25 would also have that at the ready um, to have opt-out screening for the gonorrhea and chlamydia specifically. Now, this is different than your at-risk screening, which we still will do for our, pages, our patients age 25 and up. Um, but historically, at-risk screening is just what are their risk factors and um, you know, it's gonna require a lot more in-depth um, questioning. Um, and if you're a women's health nurse practitioner or a women's health mid or a, a certified nurse midwife, you're very used to ask, asking those very in-depth, detailed sexual reproductive questions, but not everyone in primary care um, is that comfortable or has that kind of time dependent on what else they're managing on that particular day. And so to have this screening set up for everyone, regardless of sexual activity, regardless of history, um, really has shown to increase diagnostics of gonorrhea and chlamydia, which therefore decreases your risk of infertility, PID, um, and some cervical cancers. So from the patient perspective, okay? So in evidence-based practice, we're always looking at the patient perspective. That's one of the three prongs. So we really want patients to feel that they're being treated equitably. We want to decrease patient anxiety. We wanna take away potential judgment, fear, and embarrassment. So we all have had patients that we have interviewed um, and done our assessment, and we are not exactly sure if they're giving us all the information. They just met us. They may have some barriers that we're unaware of. Um, they have a fear of being judged, um, a fear of um, you know, their sexual activity, not meeting social standards. And so we may not always be getting the most inf accurate information on that given day. Um, it also may depend on who's in the room. Is there a parent in the room? Is there a spouse in the room? A significant other in the room? A grandmother in the room? Um, and so that really adds to, you know, are we getting the most accurate information? And we know that we might not always be with this type of you know, sensitive topic. And so opt-out screening goes along, you know, we PAP everyone at age 21. We do gonorrhea and chlamydia screening on everyone under the age of 25. That's our office policy and that's based on the best evidence. Um, 
also, you know, keeping in mind, uh, this may be the first time that you're seeing them that, you know, you haven't been able to establish that trusted bond uh, relationship that would require them to, to really give you all the details of their, of sexual history and their potential risk factors. So outpatient screening benefits, early detection, of course, we, we just talked about how many of these um, are asymptomatic. And so early detection and treatment can help decrease the risk of PID, um, long-term complications, um, potential cancers, infertility, other infections. Um, if pregnant, it can help um, protect the unborn child. Also from a public health standpoint and from a community health standpoint, it can reduce the risk of transmission um, uh, to the community if we can um, treat it in one individual, potentially decreasing the risk of spread to multiple other partners. Give me one second, my slide's not advancing here. We'll stop share, share again. Gotta love technology, of course. <laughs> Um, what I have next is really going over three different um, cases. Um, Julia, I don't know if you have a copy of the, the PowerPoint and maybe you can help me or not. I can stop sharing. But, yeah, I have um, a copy. Let me pull it up real quick. Okay, that'd be great. So what we'll go over though is I have three cases for opt-out screening that may be um, patients that you have seen before. And one of them I sort of already mentioned, that new patient. So let's say you have a, a new patient and the case that I have worked up is a 23 year old uh, Asian American female in graduate school for physical therapy. Um, she's coming to your office as a new patient, um, never seen her before, but once her well woman exam, um, no relevant medical or surgical history, um, uh, has a new sexual partner in the last two years. Um, she's had two lifetime partners. She participates in only vaginal uh, sex. Never been to the OBGYN before, never had a pap smear, um, but was told by some of her graduate classmates that she needed to have one. Um, uses condoms most of the time. Um, she feels safe in her relationship. She has regular periods. Um, she's not complaining of any symptoms today. Um, she's very shy, reluctant to answer some of your questions. Um, gives you very short one word answers um, and doesn't make any eye contact with you when talking about sex. So why would opt-out screening be beneficial for this patient? So, um, you know, right away as a practitioner, when I have a patient like this, I start to wonder if, I, if I'm getting all the information, are they comfortable telling me all the information? I just met them. Um, they've never been to the OBGYN before. So this entire experience is new for them. They're probably a little overwhelmed. There may be some fear. There may be some judgment. Um, for a variety of reasons, depending on their family values, their cultural values. And so opt-out screening is very simple to implement because we do this on everyone under the age of 25. And so we don't have to go into this long discussion about whether do you or don't you have to have gonorrhea chlamydia screening. It can simply be, we do this on everyone under the age of 25, just like we do a pap smear on everyone over the age of 21. You're going to have one of those today too. So um, it can be very beneficial for this patient to make sure that you're giving the best care and not missing an access to care point. Um, Julia, next slide. So a patient coming with their parents, um, they may want to avoid concerns and they may not, we've all interviewed adolescents um, and some are more open than others. Sometimes we can kind of tell when the adolescent might have more to say than they're saying um, from the nonverbals and uh, the seasoned practitioners can pick up on some of these things pretty quickly. Um, it might not just be a parent, it could be a significant other, it could be a grandparent, it could be an aunt, it could be the neighbor, um, someone bringing them to their appointment, something that makes them feel not very comfortable sharing all of their information. Um, as a provider, I have lots of experience with adolescents. I usually do ask to speak with the client 
um, on my own, I'm not always granted that privilege. And so if I'm not granted that priv privilege, um, having an opt-out policy is ideal because I can, you know, this is office policy. Every, everyone based on the CDC evidence-based recommendations, everyone in our practice under the age of 25 gets gonorrhea and chlamydia screening. Um, and so um, this particular patient is also uh, an excellent candidate for opt-out screening and only can help improve their um, patient outcomes. So next slide. The third case is a patient in a committed relationship. Um, they may feel embarrassed or they might not want to share that there are concerns um, either with their partner or maybe themselves of infidelity um, in, in a what would be considered a potentially co committed monogamous relationship. And so they might feel judged or embarrassed to tell even a trusted provider that information. They may not have been able to really um, process it themselves. And so, but it does put them at risk um, for STI, gonorrhea and chlamydia specifically. And so opt-out screening, again, would be ideal for this patient scenario because no judgment, no fear, decreasing the patient's worry because they may be worried, did they get a um, gonorrhea or chlamydia, but um, they may not be want to express that or even can't express that yet, that that's something they may be worried about. Um, and so the opt-out screening um, for everyone under the age of 25, regardless of um, relationship status, um, would work for this patient as well. Okay, next slide. So opt-out screening benefits the providers as well. It improves patient outcomes and comprehensive care. You're making sure that you're patients are getting all the testing that is needed. Um, it can decrease long-term risk and reduce the risk of transmission as we discussed earlier. Okay, next slide. Um, you know, if you have opt-out screening in your practice as a provider, um, you also um, can hardwire it into your practice. And you already do this with um, pap smears. I'm sure you have some sort of um, office policy where, you know, um, if the patient is 21 or over, they're going to get a pap smear. If they're 21 to 29, they're going to have it, um, you know, every three years. If they're um, over 30 and over, they're going to have it with co-testing and they're going to have it every five years. And so you already have these protocols in place. So adding this would just be a matter of educating um, your staff and then, of course, educating the patients. So all of our patients um, get uh, our pap smear protocol. And so this could be a GC uh, chlamydia opt-out protocol as well. And if they have any questions about their pap smear, we tell them to talk to their provider. If they have any questions about opt-out screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia, they can talk to their provider when they come into the office. Um, opt-out screening also provides a quality measure. So um, screening for chlamydia is a HEDIS measure. And so HEDIS stands for Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information Set. And it's a government tool used um, by over almost all 90% or more of our healthcare plans to measure quality, to making sure that we're meeting evidence-based guidelines. It indicates the proportion of sexually active female aged, um, it's supposed to be 16 to 24, are screened annually, and it helps apply to commercial or Medicaid managed care plans. And so as a provider, um, you know, it's just really important that we're meeting quality standards and this is one of those ways that with opt-out screening, it's going to work hand in hand with um, your HEDIS measures. Okay, next slide. So talking to your patients about opt-out screening. So as we know with um, mammograms and with pap smears, very few patients decline routine evidence-based practice screening. And so, you know, very few patients do opt out. They trust the provider-patient um, relationship. They appreciate the information. They have, appreciate the evidence-based approach. However, this is patient preference as well. And so it's okay if the patient opts out. And so some reasons to opt out may be that um, they are married and they are in a committed relationship and they don't feel like they're at risk and um, they verbalize that they would like to opt out or they have never been sexually active before, 
Um, this is an established patient of yours that you have this trusted relationship with. They're 23 years old. Um, they've been very consistent in their messaging that they're going to wait until they're married. Um, and they have never had sexual activity before. And so opting out would be completely appropriate for that. Um, one of the things that I would recommend is to make sure that you document that appropriately, um, that it was offered and it was declined because, you know, it is an evidence-based practice that gonorrhea chlamydia be offered to everyone under the age of 25. And so if a patient is going to opt out or decline, you know, just make sure that that's documented. Um, patients' questions were answered, patients declined gonorrhea and chlamydia, um, testing today. Um, this really um, also um, helps empower the patient to help give them some control over their health care and help them make some of their health care decisions and an opportunity to ask questions if they sh so choose to. So some steps for successful implementation is hardwiring these evidence-based clinical protocols um, into your everyday practice. And that may require training your staff, um, training um, some of the other providers of the, of the policy, what that what is that going to look like um, in your practice? But having these protocol hardwire is what you do with pap smears and mammograms. Um, and all of the testing that we know is evidence-based practice to ensure better patient outcomes. Um, you really want to get all champions, all key stakeholders on board to ensure all providers um, are on board, your physicians, your midwives, your nurse practitioners. Um, you can um, talk about with your um, um, electronic medical records systems, is there any flags? Um, this is used a lot in pediatrics with immunizations. If the patient doesn't have it or, or didn't get it on that day, it'll It'll show you a flag in the EMR. I know Epic is famous for that. And so is there some way that your organization can hardwire that into the electronic medical records so that every patient under 25, you have to chart whether they opt out or not? Um, the organization exam room drawers, prep tables, you know, um, it can all be set up and ready. So it would, doesn't increase time or necessarily any resources if that um, culture is waiting for you in the exam table, or if you are doing urines, that that patient has their urine done um, before they even come see you. If it's opt out, occasionally you may have to throw out the urine, but most of the time, as I said, your patients, the evidence shows us that our patients go with evidence-based practice guidelines that are recommended by their healthcare provider. And so you really wouldn't have to um, uh, uh, change practice, change practices, um, too much, um, but you'd have to have those standard operating procedures in place. And so that would require some training. It also really does provide communication and documentation to the patient about the opt-out policy. And so how is the patient getting this message that we're going to be doing this on all of our patients under the age of 25 and why? And so you might have some messaging in your waiting room, or you might have some messaging on your website, or you might have some messaging on your social media venues so that your patients know that and, and it's the way to market that you are following the latest and greatest evidence-based practice um, for their health. So those are some of the steps for successful implementation. So the key takeaways um, on this portion is that um, the 2021 CDC guidelines do endorse this opt-out screening for chlamydia and gonorrhea. It makes it um, a lot more streamlined uh, for your practice that all males and females under the age of 25, regardless of sexual activity is what the CDC recommends. The opt-out screening benefits, we talked about how it benefits the patient and how it can benefit the provider and the practices. And the opt-out screening is simple to implement and the consistency is key, which will align with your um, HEDC goals and will align with increasing access to care, decreasing judgment and fear of our patients and um, improving health outcomes. So that was everything you need to know about opt-out screening in about 20 minutes. Um, and we'll take, we'll have some time at the end for questions for sure. But, um, you know, I have always been in my practice, a very strong advocate for gonorrhea and chlamydia, uh, testing under the age of 25. Um, and so for me personally, as a provider, having an opt-out policy in my practice would really just simplify and streamline things. 
Um, you know, the, the data shows that um, in women's healthcare practices, um, gonorrhea and chlamydia screening rates are higher than in private practices. And so if you're in a family practice that's doing reproductive and, and sexual health, hardwiring that into your practice will ensure you're following the most evidence-based guidelines. So our second topic today is comprehensive testing for chronic cervicitis and PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, with mycoplasma genitalium. As I said, I'll be calling that MGen. So we are going to um, have a poll. If you could take a second, we're trying to make this a little interactive as we've been sitting here for the last 30 minutes. So very simple. Um, what is MGen? Are you familiar with it or aren't you familiar with it? And so um, we are going pretty steady here at about 50 50. Um, we'll give you just maybe another 10, 15 seconds to, to keep going here. I don't know uh, how many we have on the call, but we have up to 30, 71 voters so far. So it looks like we have a lull here for a second. And so we're going to say that. 52% uh, of you are familiar with MGen and 48 are not familiar with MGen. And so that's fantastic. So hopefully we'll be able to get you some new information here um, uh, on MGen and what it is. So next slide. So MGen, it's a prevalent often misdiagnosed sexually transmitted infection. It was first identified in male urethritis in the 1980s. Um, it cannot be, it actually, it actually can be detected by culture, but can take up to six months. So obviously that's not ideal in our diagnostic time frame uh, for treating our patients that have um, uh, a bacteria. Uh, I think I said viruses earlier in this presentation, bacteria. Um, uh, it's associated with cervicitis and pelvic inflammatory disease in women and uh, NGU in men. And um, it appears to have evolved from mycoplasma pneumonia. Um, it is prevalent, is actually more prevalent than gonorrhea um, in the US, but not as prevalent in, um, uh, as chlamydia. Next slide. So um, this is just a visual representation to kind of see like where we've come. 2021 CDC guidelines, th these MGen was mentioned in the previous set of guidelines, but is now considered an emerging STI that we need to be paying attention to. Um, and so the CDC recommends MGen to be tested for persistent or recurrent urethritis and cervicitis and to be considered for your PID uh, panel. Uh, it removed emerging threat and change the treatment guidelines. And we're gonna talk about that today. So prior to 2021, it was considered emerging threat. And now we have some treatment guidelines in the CDC uh, recommendations from July of 2021. Um, next slide. Uh, 2021 CDC guidelines uh, for symptomatic testing. So this is very important. This is not for asymptomatic, like we were talking about with gonorrhea and chlamydia. This is not a screening test. This is symptomatic testing. And so the CDC uh, sexually transmitted disease and treatment guidelines for MGen include um, cervicitis, chronic cervicitis, pelvic inflammatory disease, and male urethritis. So those are the three differentials that you're gonna be thinking of um, that you may wanna test for MGen. Next slide. So it's often overlooked but it can be harmful if left untreated because as we mentioned, it can be one of the precipitating um, factors to PID. It is detected in up to 30% of females um, with uh, cervicitis and up to 22% of our PID cases. That is pretty significant. Um, MGen can be asymptomatic. Um, the symptoms that you're gonna most often see are pain with urination, vaginal discharge, that pain in the lower abdominal abdomen and cervical motion tenderness, which we all know is one of the gold standard red flags for PID, um, bleeding after intercourse and abnormal vaginal bleeding. Um, it is responsible for about 30% of persistent or recurrent urethritis in men with the number one system um, symptom 
being pain with uh, urinating. Um, next slide. We're gonna have a great chart here um, about similar symptoms and co-infection. And so we have trichomonas, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and MGen up there. Um, we're, um, you can see why gonorrhea and chlamydia um, for PID, it may be very important because the treatment is going to be different um, if you're suspecting for PID. And so clinical presentation is uh, so similar that if left untreated, it can have those downstream health consequences like we talked about PID and infertility. Um, again, keeping in mind asymptomatic, uh, we are not testing MGEN for asymptomatic, it is not recommended for that. Um, we are gonna be thinking about co-infection as well. So we know that co-infection occurs. And so um, if we're just testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia, we may be missing MGEN, which does require different treatment. And so we're gonna talk about that next. So treatment is different for each pathogen. And so, um, uh, first of all, I want to give a plug to the CDC. If you, hopefully you have their, uh, STI app, um, everything in the app is up to date from July of 2021. It talks about all of your treatment guidelines. These guidelines were taken, um, directly from the CDC, um, that were updated in July 22, 2021. Um, it talks about your gonorrhea, um, and one of their updates was um, changes based on weight. So if you haven't peeked at that yet, look at your gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, you're looking at, uh, for people at 150 kilograms, um, there's gonna be one dose. And if they're over that weight, which we know a lot of our population is, is over 300 pounds, um, you know, that's something you're gonna be wanting to look at, 330 pounds, I believe it is, um, for different treatment recommendations for both gonorrhea, um, and PID. So um, your ceftriaxone is what you're gonna use for your gonorrhea and doxycycline is the number one recommendation, 100 milligrams, 200 times, two times a day for seven days. Um, so doxy is now the recommended for um, chlamydia. And then for your MGen, uh, you're going to hopefully um, have resistance testing available. Um, and if so, you're going to do a vistromycin or moxifloxin. We're going to talk about that a little bit more um, on the next slide. But um, again, if th these are hard to remember and you don't have to remember them because the CDC has excellent resource tools for you. Um, and I use the app all the time. It also then talks about secondary and um, uh, secondary and um, tertiary treatments, if they're allergic, if they're pregnant, um, if, if they have a variety of other uh, comorbidities. And so highly recommend the, the app for that. Next slide. So MGen um, integration is, uh, we talked about 22% of MGen is uh, associated with pelvic inflammatory disease. So again, we wanna make sure that we're treating the right thing. And so if you have a PID panel, um, you wanna make sure that MGen is being included in the, in which is probably gonorrhea and chlamydia uh, cultures. Um, uh, cervicitis, um, you wanna integrate it in your chronic cervicitis, anyone um, that um, first line treatment didn't work, and then um, chronic or complex male urethritis, you wanna be looking for MGen as well. Um, I talked a little bit about um, in the previous slide about treatment. And um, if um, resistance testing is available, um, you're gonna um, provide either doxy um, or uh, doxy and zithromycin or doxy and moxifloxin. Um, if it is not, um, available, you're going to do doxy and moxifloxin. And so again, that is all in the CDC, uh, 2021 recommendations. So obviously don't need to memorize that. Um, I mean, we all probably by now have gonorrhea and chlamydia, uh, memorized, um, but MGen will take a little bit more time to, to, to store up there. Um, but, um, you want to be thinking about this on um, the key takeaways on the next slide are gonna be around 
of the diagnostic for MGen. The 2021 CDC guidelines recommend MGen to be tested for persistent or recurrent urethritis and considered for chronic cervicitis and PID. Um, testing facilities, identifying the causes of pathogen given co-infection and overlapping symptoms with other common STIs, as we showed with the graft, that gonorrhea, chlamydia, MGen, they can all have very common um, symptoms. And so this is different than vaginitis. You notice I kept saying chronic cervicitis. And so we're cervicitis being the key uh, takeaway of the symptom that we're looking for, um, not necessarily for vaginitis. So when we're ruling out BV, trick, and yeast, this is not the what we're, we're talking about, the pathogen for, for those. Um, what we're talking about is this chronic cervicitis, which lead, often leads to our, our PIDs for our female patients. Um, incorporating MGen testing for symptomatic patients. Again, that key word, symptomatic. MGen is not a screening tool for asymptomatic. Um, it's simple to implement and critical for determining appropriate treatment. And so when we were having this conversation about this presentation today, you know, I really wanted one of my take home messages to be from an evidence-based practice standpoint is I needed to be assured that ordering this lab was going to change my management. And it does. It changes the uh, medication, the pharmacological management that you're going to give. It's going to ensure success rates on PID. Think about your PID patients and how closely we follow them, right? So a rule out PID, we're going to have them back in the office in three days. Or we're going to have them on the phone. We're going to follow up with them. And that's because our treatments don't always work, right? I mean, we have a protocol for patients that, who need to be hospitalized with PID. And historically, we've been missing this 22% of these patients that have PID because the underlying pathogen is MGen and we weren't treating them appropriately. And so now this is another tool in our toolbox to making sure that our patients are getting the testing necessary to ensure the appropriate treatment to um, increase, um, to improve patient outcomes and decrease long-term effects. So that's why I got so excited to learn more and to talk more about MGen because it's all about improving patient outcomes and making sure that we're giving the right medication to the right patient at the right time. And so, you know, having this lab in your tool belt, in your toolbox is really going to help you improve your patient outcomes.